good to be here. If you'll turn to the book of Ruth. We'll pick up where we left off last week. All right, Father, I pray, Lord, now for the gift of teaching. And then, Father, I pray the folks have ears to hear and a heart, Lord, a heart that's receptive, a heart that searches, a heart that's hungry. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, now this morning I'm going to pick up again on the kinsman redeemer. Last week I didn't uh, uh, in any way finish what I intended to say about the kinsman redeemer and today I'm going to pick it up and kind of tie some things together for you uh, you might be surprised at how this uh, this affects life today as we know it but in chapter number two of the book of Ruth and verse number one Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech and his name was Boaz the Hebrew word kinsman here is goel, goel. And um, this literally refers back to a, 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 a reference to the law and to uh, God uh, maintaining order and civility uh, among his people. Uh, if you don't have the laws, laws are for lawbreakers. You understand that? If you're not a lawbreaker, there's no need for a law. And the law cannot change the heart of the individual who breaks the law. All it can do is, 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 um, is issue punishment and condemnation. That's all the law could do, all it could ever do, all it could ever, ever will be able to do is do that. So why someone would place themselves under the law and think that would save them is beyond me. But uh, the purpose of the law is, to, uh, is for lawbreakers. So when you have murderers and rapists and men stealers, and so forth, living in your midst, therefore you have to have laws that govern uh, the conduct of a situation like that. The, uh, the Code of America, uh, I've been told by attorneys, is based upon the Ten Commandments and going back to British law, Blackstone's law, Blackstone's, uh, the book of Blackstone, his, uh, his method of uh, interpretation and, and application of the scriptures the scriptural application of law through civil society. But uh, the kinsman redeemer uh, played a very important role in the culture and life of an Israelite in the Old Testament. And you'll find reference to it in the New Testament. We'll get to that in just a few minutes. But here are the three main things that a kinsman redeemer did. Number one is to purchase back the forfeited inheritance for an Israelite. And you could come upon bad times, sickness, displacement, what have you, war, and this and that, <laughs> that could cause you to lose your inheritance or be alienated or estranged from it. And so the, uh, the, the, the kinsman redeemer was there put in place so that you could get that back. God did not want a perpetual uh, underclass in Israel, well, no part of it. And... Uh, so therefore, he, he implemented these laws. Now, of course, you can make an application of that to uh, what the Lord Jesus Christ did when he went to the cross because he bought back what Satan had uh, lawfully taken from us right. when we handed it to him Amen. and sold ourselves into sin. The second thing is to ransom a kinsman from bondage who could be taken in bondage to a foreigner, could be carried off captive, what have you. The kinsmen had the right to ransom them back. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, when he went to the cross, paid the sin debt for us. He bought us back from the power of sin. And the power of sin is the power of Satan. Satan's power is through sin, deceit, lying, and rebellion against God. That's where his power lies. His power does not lie in righteousness and holiness and obedience to God. Think about that for a moment. Think about that for a moment. Satan, therefore, had taken man bondage into bondage because man was a willing accomplice in yielding to sin and rebellion and all that went with it. And Satan, being the god of this world, had every right 
to bind them up and take them captive at his will. You see, that's important to understand. And when the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world, he came into this world, and he defeated Satan in the very area of Satan's power, and that's death, because sin ultimately leads to death. And the scripture says that the Lord Jesus Christ likewise took part of the same, that he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Now, is Satan, has Satan been destroyed? He's been destroyed in his power. In other words, in his authority over with using death as the ultimate weapon against mankind. That power has been destroyed because Christ has given us life and Satan can no longer wield that power over us. And then the third one is the avenging of death. And this is what I want to talk about with you this morning. The avenging of death or the avenger of death or the, uh, the avenger of blood. That was a very powerful thing in Israel, and it was part of their code of honor. That if uh, something had been done to them, been wronged, one of, their, one of their family members had been murdered, then it was incumbent. It was a code of honor. It was required. It was expected of a family member to avenge that blood. That's where you get the term eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And so... Uh, Consider now the fact that you live in a society where it is, ex it, is, it, is the, it is the social expectation of the people that if someone heinously murders your wife or your husband or your children, you are expected to, to uh, exact revenge from them and shed their blood. Well, now, to this very day, that is all over the world the blood feud, the blood avenging, that can be found everywhere, not just in one or two cultures, not just in Western European or in, uh, in the, uh, for example, the Arab or what have you. It can be found everywhere. And uh, the reason for that is because man has within him a conscience, and that conscience says that you can kill a dog, that's one thing, but you kill a man, that's something else entirely. And the situation as the Bible presents it for us, man wants peace. Man wants, uh, he wants to live in prosperity. He wants all these things that God freely grants. But here's the problem. Man wants them without righteousness. Think about that. Because there will be no peace, there will be no prosperity, there will be no joy without righteousness. And so it comes upon the rulers of the people, whether it be a king or whether it be a parliament or whether it's a prime minister or a president, whatever, whatever system of government they have. It comes upon the leaders of the people as the representatives of God because they are the representatives of God in civil government, in civil government. They're not preaching the gospel. Barack Obama is not a minister of Christ. But the fact that you live in civil government, when I say civil, I'm talking about this is not the jungle, although there are places in America where, believe me, you are in the jungle. Believe me, you are. You would, do very, you would be very wise before you go into some cities to find out from a local the safe places to go in that city. You would be very wise because uh, there are places in this, in the, in this country where... Uh, even, even the people who live there live in fear and they keep their doors locked and they know where they can go and where they can't go. <coughs> but it's incumbent upon the government to maintain order and civility. But the problem is when a government gets away from righteousness, it gets away from righteousness. It gets away from the law of righteousness. It gets away from the law of God. It gets away from the, the fact that, that man made in the image of God. When it gets away from that, then it becomes a man-made, arbitrary thing. Like, for example, look what's happening to the Attorney General right now in the United States. I don't know if you keep up with the news or not, but this man's on the hot seat like you wouldn't believe. And this man is about to face some questioning from the Congress. He, he does understand that he is accountable to a higher power. He is not a law unto himself. He's not a sovereign. He cannot take the position Charles took, Charles I took, and say, I'm a sovereign and nobody can question me, and the parliament says, we'll question you. They cut his head off. 
and he was the last British sovereign who tried to exercise that kind of authority. He's going to face judgment. Now, the man who is the president who appointed him uh, may take the position that, uh, well, I appointed him, but I didn't have a clue what all he was doing, and so just throw him under the bus. You know, a lot of things can happen. It would be interesting to watch it as it unfolds. You'll, you'll find out in due time. But the bottom line is he's the chief law enforcement officer in the country. Now, I want to make a point here. Please listen carefully to what I'm saying. He's the chief law enforcement officer of the country. He represents the law. He's the attorney general, all right? He represents the law. The people will only respect the law as long as it is administered justly. Once the law is administered unjustly, and you're watching that through the IRS, and you're watching it through the Attorney General, and it's become common knowledge in this nation, that people are very upset because they, they sense a, an unjustness about the way the law is being administered. What happens then? Well, you've lost that element of righteousness, and the government loses, people lose respect for the government, and the next step is anarchy. That's what you see in Europe. The reason you see all these people in the streets right now in Europe is because they have lost respect for the government. For example, right now in France, tens of thousands of young Frenchmen in their 20s and their 30s have been marching through the streets of France. You didn't see anything about it, CBS, NBC, and ABC. You didn't see anything about it because it did not fit their agenda. Why are they marching and demonstrating in the streets of France? Somebody tell me. Well, that's one thing, but there's something else, too. There's something else. There's something else that's a big deal in France. It's a big deal. They're passing laws in, in countries about it. In this country, they so, they so freely embrace it like it's the most wonderful thing in the world. But in these European countries, they are rioting against it. Anybody know? Gay marriage. That's what these young people are screaming to high heaven about in the streets of France. Gay marriage. Here's the problem with the average American. He lives in a little bubble. He thinks because his mind is so brainwashed and he's so liberal and progressive in his thinking, he thinks the whole world thinks like that. He really does. That makes him very vulnerable. So let's get back to our text. When the government is no longer perceived to be righteous, then people no longer obey it. And that's when you have anarchy. And that's when you have rebellion. And that's when all kinds of things can happen. So the scripture has a guidelines that it lays down for this. The Goel avenged the death of the slain. He avenged the death of a brother, a sister, mother, a father. I'm going to give you one illustration of it in the Old Testament. In the book of First, Second Samuel 13, it's the case of Amnon. How many of you remember who Amnon was? Well, he took his sister Tamar, which was his half-sister. Here's the biggest problem in the Old Testament. You've got so many halves. They all got the same daddy and different mothers. And that's the problem you get into. And he took his half-sister Tamar, forced himself upon her, raped her. And then when he got finished with her in, chapter, in 2 Samuel 13, 15, he hated her exceedingly. So that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. Did he ever love her? No, he lusted for her. And then Amnon said unto her, Arise, be gone. All right, he fulfilled his lust. Had nothing to do with love. He never loved her. And so the Bible's very clear about stuff like this. But now Tamar has a brother, and his name is Absalom. And Tamar's brother Absalom is a full brother. Same mother, same father. Absalom loved his sister Tamar. And when he saw what Amnon had done to her, the law of the avenger of blood kicked in. In 2 Samuel chapter number 13, verse 20, Absalom, her brother, said to her, Hath Amnon thy brother been with thee? But hold now thy peace, my sisters, thy brother, regard not this thing. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. Verse 22, And Absalom spake to his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad. For Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister Tamar. That is when it gets scary. He didn't say anything. He bided his time. This is a case here in the Old Testament where Absalom was waiting for the right moment to strike. And that's exactly what he did. 
In verse number 28, Absalom had commanded his servants, saying, Mark you now, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, they had a feast, he invited Amnon. Everything's hunky-dory, just fine. Come on over and let's have a feast. So Amnon comes to the feast, totally ignorant of the fact that Absalom had murder in his heart. So the Bible says in verse 28, Absalom had commanded his servants, saying, Mark you now, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine. How's another way of saying that? Drunk. And when I say to you, smite Amnon, then kill him. Fear not. Have not I commanded you? Be courageous and be valiant. In other words, I'll take responsibility for it. You do what I tell you to do. And the servants of Absalom did unto Amnon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose, and every man got him to, upon his mule and fled. The reason they rode mules is because God told them, and, and David rode a mule. And when, uh, and when his son rebelled against him, why a mule instead of a horse? A horse is the mark of a victor. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, he'll come back on a white mule or horse? Horse. A mule is a hybrid that cannot reproduce. It's a man-made thing, in other words. In 2 Samuel 13, 32, And Jonadab, the son of Shemaiah, David's brother, answered, said, Let not my Lord suppose that they have slain all the young men, the king's sons, for Amnon only is dead. For by the appointment of Absalom, this hath been determined from the day that he forced his sister Tamar. See what it says? It's plain. He set about from that moment on to do him in. Did he do it? Yes, he did. What did he appeal to? He appealed to the kinsman redeemer, to the law of blood revenge. And he did. Now let's say, for example, that you had had some incident happen. Someone died at your hand in the Old Testament, and it was an accident but the blood revenger was after you. God made a provision. He put six cities of refuge in the Old Testament, three on one side of Jordan, three on the other side of Jordan, as a place you could flee to till the elders brought your case out, considered it, and if you were guilty, then they turned you over. If you were not guilty, you stayed there till the death of the high priest, which is quite a remarkable thing. And when the high priest died, then you could, be, you could leave the city of refuge. I would suggest, though, that you watch over your shoulder when you leave the city of refuge. The cities of refuge are uh, Kadesh, which means holy, that all are a type of Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ, of course, is holy. Shechem, shoulder, it means shoulder. And, of course, upon the Lord Jesus Christ, rest on his shoulder, rest the government of the people and us. And then Hebron. And that means fellowship. And so the Lord Jesus is our fellowship. Try to fellowship with God outside him one time, and you'll see what happens. You'll be fellowshipping with yourself. You'll be sitting in a yoga lotus position, as they, as they do in these churches today, quoting some mantra. And then you'll be thinking about this kundalini power coming up the back of your spine and its head coming over the top of your head. And all of these seven chakra points in your body, and you'll be... You'll be one with the spirit of the universe, and you think that's Christianity. That's sad, friend. That's so sad. That's so sad. How in the world you can mix Hinduism and Christ is beyond me. But in any event, the, the other side was Bezer, which means fortress. Jesus is my fortress. I flee to him. Ramoth Gilead on the east side. Ramoth Gilead means high, high place, and so is Christ high to me. Once I find where he's located, I am definitely brought in the presence of the Lord. And then Golan, that name means joy. In the Old Testament, God allowed a place of mercy, and that place of mercy was in the tabernacle. And, of course, when I say in the tabernacle, I'm talking about the tabernacle proper, which means the outside court. The, the, the tent structure itself and then inside the holy place and the most holy. Outside on the altar was a extrusion called a horn and they could come up and take hold of the horns of the altar. By doing that they were pleading for mercy from God. The horns of the altar represented God's strength and they were saying I'm no longer strong, I'm taking hold of your strength and I'm yielding myself to thee and I'm, I'm pleading for mercy. I'll give you two illustrations in the Old Testament of when that happened. One was Adonijah. He, uh, at the, uh, at the uh, death of David, as David was dying, uh, some of his uh, confederates marched him through the streets of Jerusalem and said, Hail the king. And Adonijah, of course, was a half-brother to Solomon. And so he was uh, hailed as the king. 
But Bathsheba wanted David to understand, you know, you know the story of David and Bathsheba, how far back it goes. She wanted him to understand, now David, you're about to leave this world, be gathered to your fathers. Let's make certain that Solomon is understood to be your successor as the king of Israel. And of course, David uh, consented to that because he wanted Solomon to be the king. And uh, it, once it came out that David had supported Solomon and they all knew it and knew it well, then Adonijah feared because he was afraid that Solomon was going to have him put to death because of what he's done, because of what he'd done. And here's what, he's, what he did. In 1 Kings 1.50, Adonijah feared because of Solomon, rose, went, and caught hold on the horns of the altar, begging for mercy. Here's what Solomon did. It shows his character. This is one good mark of his character. And it was told Solomon, saying, Behold, Adonijah feareth King Solomon, for lo, he hath caught hold the horns of the altar, saying, Let King Solomon swear to me today that he will not slay his servant with a sword. Solomon said, If he will show himself a worthy man, there shall not an hair of him fall to the earth, but if wickedness shall be found in him, he shall die. Seeing so King Solomon sent, they, found, they brought him down from the altar. He came and bowed himself to King Solomon. Solomon said to him, Go to your house. He showed him mercy. He showed him mercy. Now, of course, if you keep reading your Bible, you'll find out something else happened later. But he showed him mercy at this case, didn't he? But now in the case of Joab, Joab was one of David's generals. And Joab and David went back a long way. Uh, Joab, here's the problem with Joab. Joab was, uh, Joab was, was brought into uh, in the council very close with David because Joab was the one who sent the letter to Uriah. Uriah carried his own death warrant into battle. So therefore Joab knew about all of the palace intrigue. He knew about all of it. He knew too much. And uh, Joab uh, was, uh, uh, came down the time of his, uh, of his end in 1 Kings 2.28. 2, he said he took hold of the horns of the altar. But in his case, it was told King Solomon, verse 29, Joab fled, took hold of the horns of the altar. Solomon sent Benaiah the son of Joy to Jehoiada saying, go fall upon him. Smite him from the earth. No mercy to be shown. Why? Well, if you look at 1 Kings 2.32, the Lord shall return his blood upon his own head, who fell upon two men more righteous and better than he, and slew them with a sword. My father David, not knowing thereof, to wit Abner, the son of Ner, the captain of the host of Israel, and Amasa, the son of Jether, captain of the host of Judah. What happened to these two? Here's what happened to them. He slew, he shed the blood of war during a time of peace. He was treacherous in the way that he dealt with both these men, Abner and Amasa. He murdered them. Of course, he had a personal vendetta. And God brought his blood down on top of his own head. Now, I've introduced the word vendetta. The word vendetta comes from Italian, which comes from Latin. The Latin word is vindictus. Vindictus. We've heard of a vindicator, haven't we? In English, you have the English word vindicator. What is a vindicator? It's someone who exacts justice and judgment in a situation. That's a vindicator. When you go to a court of law, you expect the court of law to exact justice and judgment on the guilty party. It becomes the vindicator. It becomes the one who sets it right, who sets the record straight. When George Thomas had his second trial, now he was convicted the second time. And he was, of course, one of the perpetrators of the murder of those two kids a few years ago. And the family's been put through more hell, so to speak, on this earth. There appears to be no real justice or vindication in the court of law. Amen. See, that's the problem. That's the problem. And people don't forget that kind of thing. People have a long memory when it comes to stuff like that. So the avenging of blood, it's the avenger of blood. It is the one who steps in and does something to avenge blood. Now, the Lord said something in the New Testament. Before I read what he said, I'm going to read just a little bit to you 
about the avenging of blood, the feuds. Now, everybody's heard of the Hatfields McCoys, haven't you? Hatfield McCoy. Well, now, that's not a, that's not a uh, myth. That's a reality. And uh, you can find all, all kinds of McCoy graves and all kinds of Hatfield graves because it's a blood feud. And you say to yourself, well, these must be two crazy families to kill each other off all this time. No, no, no. It goes back to something much deeper, much further back. And once you begin to understand that, then you'll understand the New Testament as it relates to feuds, blood feuds, blood feuds. In the ancient Hebrew context, it was considered the duty of the individual and family to avenge evil on behalf of God. The executioner of the law of blood revenge was personally put the initial, who personally put the initial killer to death was given a special designation, Goel Hadam, the blood avenger or blood redeemer. And I'm reading to you from Wikipedia. And the reason I'm reading from Wikipedia is because the article's pretty good. I don't know if you've ever checked out Wikipedia. Get on the internet and you'll find it uh, about anything you want to know. You'll find it. I'm not so sure that you can vouch for the veracity of all of it, but it's, for the most part, sounds pretty good. But they've got a good article in here about blood feud. In the Middle Ages, from beginning to end, and particularly the feudal era, lived under the sign of private vengeance. The onus, of course, lay above all on the wronged individual. Vengeance was imposed on him as the most sacred of duties. The solitary individual, however, could do but little. Moreover, it was most commonly a death that had to be avenged. In this case, the family group went into action, and the fayed or fod, which comes, to, which comes down to us as the feud, came into being. To use the old dramatic word, which spread little by little through the whole of Europe, the vengeance of kinsmen we call fayda as a German canonist expressed it. No moral obligation seemed more sacred than this. The whole kindred, therefore, placed as a rule under the command of a chieftain, took up arms to punish the murder of one of its members or merely a wrong that had been suffered. Now, illustration after illustration after illustration, I won't go through all of that, but I'm going to bring you down to something. In Corsica, for example, Corsica is an island that lies off the eastern coast of France between France and Italy. Therefore, you have France on one side, Italy on the other. There's a mixture here. You find a lot of that in Europe. You'll find a mixture from one culture to another culture, and they create their own culture. It's a blending. You know the mafia is uh, headquartered in Sicily. You understand that the mafia has a code that they live by. And that uh, if you violate that code, then they live under the blood feud code. And they'll do away with you, wipe you from the face of the earth. Corsica is like that because even to this very day, right now, the code of the blood feud is very important to these people. An ancient code. You kill my father, I'm going to kill your father. Or I'm going to kill somebody close to you. Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon I, the one who tried to create an empire for France after the French Revolution, late, eight, late 1700s, the first part of the 1800s, it was M Napoleon who, was, who, was, uh, who, who became the, uh, the leader of the, the, the establisher of the French Empire. He was a Corsican. He came from Corsica. That was his birthplace. So, uh, in Corsica, vendetta was a social code that required Corsicans, required, social code that required Corsicans to kill anyone who wronged the family honor. Between 1820 and 1852, no less than 4,300 murders were perpetrated in Corsica. Now, keep in mind that just a few months ago, a well-known attorney was murdered in Corsica at a gas station and it was all attributed to a blood feud. So it's still going on. The Basque Country, late Middle Ages, the War of the Bands, and Navarre, and Biscay, so forth and so on. Blood feuds. An expert on conditions in the Caucasus wrote in the mid-19th century, among the mountain people, 
The blood feud is not an uncontrollable permanent feeling such as the vendetta is among the Corsicans. It is more like an obligation imposed by public opinion. In the Dag Dagestani Kadar, one such blood feud between two antagonistic clans lasted for nearly 260 years, from the 17th century till the 1860s. The mountain people were forced by public opinion to engage in a blood feud. Due to the Celtic heritage of many whites living in Appalachia, now you're at home. This is your backyard. Due to the Celtic heritage of many whites living in Appalachia, a series of prolonged violent engagements in late 19th century Kentucky and West Virginia were referred to commonly as feuds, a tendency that was partly due to the 19th century popularity of William Shakespeare and Sir Walter Scott, both of whom wrote semi-historical accounts of blood feuds. These incidents, the most famous of which was the Hatfield-McCoy feud, were regularly featured in the newspapers of eastern U.S. between the Re Reconstruction era and the early 20th century and are seen by some as linked to a southern culture of honor with its roots in the Scots-Irish forebears of the residents of the area. Another prominent example is the Regulator-Moderator War, which took place between rival factions in the Republic of Texas. It is sometimes considered the largest blood feud in American history. This kind of gives you an idea of the way people think around here. Let me tell you something. You might be removed two generations, or even three generations, from what went on with the Hatfield-McCoy feud, but the mindset is still there. Still there. People still, that it's just part of their culture. It's what their mothers and fathers tell their children as they grow up, and it's the way people see things. They don't see things the same way. America is a melting pot, no doubt about that, folks. But sometimes, certain cultures get stuck to the pie side of the pot <laughs> and don't fully melt into the, globe, into the national culture of an American. Remember once, one more time. America being a melting pot means that the identity that you came from, whether you're an African or whether you're a, you're a Frenchman or you're a German or you're a Spaniard or an Englishman or Russian or whatever you are, you're not a Russian American. You're an Italian American. You're an American. What does it mean to be an American? That's a good question, don't you think? Let me tell you what it means to be an American. It's all up here. It has to do with the way you think. It's an ideology. It's when you stand up and you say, isn't this a free country? That's what it means to be an American. Isn't this a free country? We came here for freedom. We didn't come over here to make another Italy out of it. We didn't come over here to make another China out of it. We didn't, we didn't come over here to redo Cuba. This is America, and it has to do with the way you think. In other words, it's built on an ideology, all right? The fourth estate. How many of you know what the fourth estate is? All right. I know I'm getting into social, to, uh, social things, but this helps you understand where you are. The first estate is the clergy, and it's called the estates of the realm. The first estate's the clergy, or the church. The second estate has to do with nobility, as you might say in this country, the government. The third estate has to do with the worker, the business owner, the people who, who invest the money. The fourth estate is the news media. How many, of you have heard the, how many of you have heard the news media in the last few days say it is the place of journalism to hold the government accountable because we have to know what they're doing so the people can be informed and an informed populace can go to the polls and vote and vote because they vote based on knowledge. How many of you heard that? All right. What happens when you have a controlled media? What happens when the media becomes a lapdog to whatever president who may be in office? then it's not fulfilling its responsibility, right? The estates of the realm, therefore, represent 
the whole makeup and nature of society, okay? That's what the estates of the realm represent. The fourth estate is the news media. Is the news media powerful? You, you better believe it. Because most of the people in the country are accustomed to being spoon-fed. And all they know is what they get on their evening newscast. Somebody spoon-feeds them. And, uh, and that's sad because that's liberty and a republic and our freedoms are not built on ignorance. They're built on the fact that people know what's going on in the republic. And of course, I had much, 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 much rather have a republic based on a constitution that was drafted by men who feared God than to live in a democracy where the, where the, where the, where the number of the outlaw, when they, when they outnumber the people who are, who are uh, law, law, law keepers, or, uh, they outnumber them, then they control them and they destroy them. Now, how do we think? What do we think? What affects our mind? What affects the way we do things? All right? Let's take an example. These two murderers up here in Boston, Massachusetts the other day indiscriminately blew up little children, mothers and fathers, all in the name of Allah. What's the point? The point is that they're going to change the world and make it become uh, subservient to Allah and they are going to take the earth and it will become it will serve their God and it doesn't matter to them if you convert uh, willfully or if they put a sword to your throat they're going to convert you or they'll wipe you from the face of the earth now this blood feud blood feud somebody kills your wife somebody kills your children somebody kills your family I hope you never have to go through the victim side of the criminal justice system in this country. Because if you ever go through the victim side, you're going to find out that all the laws, for the most part, are stacked against you. That they are, the laws have been written for the perpetrators. And you have to understand this, and I'll make a lot of people mad, but the truth of the matter is, if you don't have a lot of litigation, then the lawyers don't have any work. And make no mistake about it, they're going, to, they're going to see to it that they've got plenty of work. So they're going to drag it out as much as they can. Okay. Now let's say you lived 2,000 years ago and you lived, you lived in a time where blood feud was just as much part of your daily talk as I'm talking to you right now or who won the last baseball game or, who, or what it, when the next election is coming up. You lived in a time when blood feud, kinsman redeemer, was all just part of your culture. Turn to Matthew 5, and you'll get an entirely new perspective on this this morning. Matthew chapter number 5, verse 38. Matthew 5, 38. Ye have heard that it had been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's blood feud. Kinsman, redeemer, blood for blood, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But I say to you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to, to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. <laughs> The Bible's a wonderful book till you get to certain areas of it, right? <laughs> That's hard to swallow. It's not hard to swallow if it's all philosophical with you this morning. But it's hard to swallow if you've got a brother or a sister or a son or a daughter, husband or wife, mother or father, victim of a murderer. Yeah. 
And that's the difference in the Bible because the Bible covers these areas of life. And it's not, the Bible doesn't deal with you on an intellectual level. It could, and it does in some places, I, I'm, I'm sure of that. But the Bible wants to talk to your heart. And I heard a man when he was talking about his heart, he said, the heart's right here. I thought to myself, son, you don't understand your essence one bit. The heart is the seat of the soul. Is this where your soul is located? There's a whole lot more to your soul than the brain. Keep that in mind. When the Bible talks about your heart, it's talking about the seat of your soul. And that's who you are. So how do you deal with that? What do you do with that? What do you do with a man who comes along and tells you, you've had it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, <clears throat> but I say to you, how do you deal with that? What do you think? Well, you know, the apostle deals with that in the book of Romans and throughout the New Testament. He said, render to Caesar that which is Caesar's. You have to have civil government. The Bible said he's a minister of God and so forth. And remember, I said all this stuff at the beginning of the lesson this morning about righteousness. Do you believe that the government of the United States of America is righteous? You don't? I wonder how many people, if you ask them, if you did a survey on the street, you know, get Fox to send this guy out. Who's his name? Waters? Now, Mr. Waters, here's your mic. Get out there. Ask these people, do you believe that the government of the United States is righteous? You see, the Lord governs you based on righteousness because you know he's righteous and you know he's holy. Therefore, you submit to him. You have no problem submitting to him. He's your father, right? Yeah. You submit to his authority because he's righteous. He's holy. You don't argue with him about it. You just know in your heart and in your soul, I'm wrong, he's right. How many got that right? How many believe that? I'm wrong, he's right. He's always right. When I agree with him, I'm right. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm wrong. Okay, there's no problem with that. But when you have a government that's not righteous, then you get into a sticky situation. You know what's happening with Russia right now? The missiles send into Hafas Assad or Bashir. Yeah, which one is it? Bashir. Hafas was his daddy. Bashir Assad, he's sending these missiles over there to Syria. Did you know that when, when Saddam Hussein was the president of Iraq, and I just saw this on, uh, on Pat Robertson's uh, World Christian News. When Saddam Hussein was the president of Iraq, that the Christians in that country, the Christians in Iraq, lived in essentially freedom and with no persecution from the government, and that, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, he, uh, he essentially let them live as Iraqis, as Christians. You see, here's what he had to do, and I'm going to run out of time. He had to juggle. This is what uh, he, was he was juggling. Do you know what's happening right now in Iraq? The Sunni Muslim and the Shiite Muslim are going at it again. They hate each other. And I told you where they came from. The Sunni Muslim, the Shiite Muslim, they despise each other. That's what's going on in Syria. But here in Syria, it's more than just, more than just a religious clash. You've got nations involved now. Because you've got Lebanon, you've got Iran, and you've got Russia. Now here's what just happened. Benjamin Netanyahu warned Vladimir Putin. Israel warned the bear, don't send Rus uh, missiles into Syria. Little Israel stood up against Russia and told them, don't send any missiles into Syria. They fall into the hands of Hezbollah or any of them. They're all their enemy. And they'll come raining down on us or shooting our planes out of the sky. In plainer words, little Israel has now confronted Russia, the bear, Gog and Magog. Are you watching this? Are you seeing a confrontation now between a nation that didn't even exist 70 years ago and the bear? Boy, that kind of thing gets me excited. It really does. Yes, sir. Yeah.
They brought the military in. The military. World War One. So when you when you're talking about twenties and thirties. Yeah. What was it about? Mine, mining, about the big business, about uh, yeah, striking wages. Uh, uh, they needed the coal for steel. And, and, you know, oh, okay. So it was strike breaker, strike breaking the strike. They. So the love of freedom is the root of all evil. Oh yeah, brother. Well, yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. But, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. I mean, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on right now that uh, that's not too kosher. All right, we'll have word prayer. We'll let you go. God bless you. Pick it up again next week, Lord willing. I hope that's been helpful for you. Kind of put stuff in context. Amen. Brother McLeod, will you dismiss us, please?